Kia ora koutou. I'm going to show you. Kia ora koutou. I'm going to show you.
So good to see you all this morning. Uh, we're going to jump into some worship. I'm excited. It's going to be a beautiful day. Uh, let's go. Thank you. 
builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the numbers of the stars and calls each of them by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that we can come and worship you today. Thank you that you are God, creator of all, creator of earth, creator of the universe, creator of the stars, but that you love each person here, that you want to have an intimate relationship with every single person here. So Lord, as we come and worship your name today, as we praise your name, Lord, I pray that each person might know just how loved they are, no matter what what we're going through, Lord, what the mess is, Lord, or whether we're in the valley or on the mountaintop, Lord, you see us, you see where we're at, and you care so deeply. God of the universe, creator of all, loves us, and we thank you for that, Father. In your precious name, amen. All right, church, if you just want to grab a seat, welcome, a huge welcome to Life Zone. Uh, Welcome if you're watching online, it's fantastic to have you with us. If you're new today, once again, awesome, awesome to have you join us, join our church Barno. In fact, if you're joining us today for the first time, today is a really good day to join us. Because I don't know about you, but I can be a little bit slack. Put your hands up if you read the church news this week. Oh, you guys are better than me, I'm terrible. Okay, for those of you that didn't read the church news or perhaps maybe skimmed it a little bit quickly, I don't know if you know, but today we are having a feast, a celebration feast. We are having our first Matariki feast, and everyone is welcome. Everyone is welcome. You can tell I'm tired. My little girls have been keeping me up a bit this week. But seriously, after church today, we are going to clear this auditorium, and we're going to have a sit-down feast. It's for everyone. Everyone here, you can come over and grab a few other people. And we're going to have the most amazing meal. We're going to have, I've seen the roast chicken, uh, sorry, the roast pumpkin and roast kumara out there. They're getting those nice countdown chicken, rotisserie chickens. And I even hear we've got Carleen's super gravy. So it's going to be a fabulous feast. It's free. We just want to, we've started on an awesome bicultural journey together as a church. And it, Matariki is the Māori New Year, and it's a celebration. And as you know, the Māori culture is all about being together as whānau and celebrating with kai. So Tim and an awesome team have organised a a wonderful feast for us today. So if you're new, please stay. If you're part of our church whānau, please stay. We are going to have some awesome kai. Actually, if you are new, we have these connect cards. Connect card, nothing weird, it's just how can we help you? So please do fill it in. Uh, And if you want to take it to the cafe afterwards, you can get a free hot drink. Now, the cafe will be running for 15 minutes after the service, so you can still get your coffee fix for those of you that haven't quite had your morning one or are ready for your second, or in Steve's case, his fourth, (laughs) third, sorry, third coffee. Uh, So the cafe will still be going for coffees. And pretty much, we're going to get cleared in here, and we're going to be sitting down and hopefully having this feast by 11 o'clock. So it's going to roll on quite quickly. But if you're new, we'd love to know how can we help you. Right, we're going to carry on with some worship in a minute. We have communion stations around the auditorium. It's just a cool way where we can just take a moment to thank Jesus for what he did. That creator of the earth creator of the universe loves us so much that he would die for us the bread represents his body broken the wine his blood shed and he did it all for us in whatever state we're at because he loves us and as part of our worship to him also as you know we have tithes and offerings there's a box at the back where you can put that and if you want to put a poor half for the for the feast you can but there is no no expectation um, and many of you do it by AP or if you're watching online there's a link you can click below our offering is just part of our way that we can give back to God and put him first in all we do 
Well, without any further ado, I think we're going to carry on and worship. So please stand and let's lift our hands to the creator of the universe who loves us so much that he would die for us. Yesterday um, and today, yeah, today, um, there's been a bunch of people who have been uh, worshiping God, uh, not in this auditorium, but in the kitchen, uh, preparing a, a meal for Matariki, um, which is so beautiful and awesome um, of them. Um, but you might be asking, what is Matariki? We have a picture up there on the screen of a cluster of stars. Uh, around the rest of the world, it's known as the Pleiades. I think that's how you pronounce it. I'm not sure, but um, the Pleiades. And uh, in the Bible, it actually mentions the Pleiades three times. There's two verses I'll read here. Um, Job 9 verse 9, it says, He made all the stars, the bear and Orion, the Pleiades, and the constellations of the southern sky. Amos 5 verse 8 uh, says, I think we're getting a new um, PA system or something like that. I don't know. Um, at some point, um, Amos 5 verse 8 says, It is the Lord who created the stars, the Pleiades and Orion. Yahweh is his name. Um, and in the Bible, stars hold special weight. It says in Genesis 1 that when God created the stars, that um, he says, Let them be signs to mark the seasons and days and years. And in New Zealand, Matariki can't be seen for a period of months. Back, um, that's something that Māori really looked forward to because they're like, that's the start of the new year. It's the start of the new year. So um, Māori would um, harvest their crop and they would have a feast um, and they would remember the last year and they would also look forward to the next crop crops they're going to plant. And so there's a lot to do with growth in there, a lot to do with um, how you know, crops have grown, but not just crops, but also as a community, how how have we grown as a community? Everyone's gotten a year older, and um, hopefully we've gotten a year wiser as well. Um, and in this community, as Lifezone, we want to be growing. We want to be growing in our Christ-likeness. We want to grow to be more like Jesus. Yeah, and in Philippians 1 verse 6, it says, I'm certain that God who began a good work in you will continue his work until he's finally finished on the day that Christ Jesus returns. And so God's growing each and one, one of us. It's something we desire and we believe in. And at Lifezone, we have some values. Come as you are, grow deep, and live large. We're something we're really passionate about. Steve, a couple of, it was like a couple months ago, he preached a message on that grow deep part. It was like, sometimes at Lifezone, we talk a lot about come as you are, um, but we don't talk so much about that grow deep part. And in the room that day, there was some people that were really inspired by that korero. Um, one person in particular was Esther Savage. She's a songwriter in this church. She was inspired by that korero. And one line that Steve said that God says, come as you are, but I love you too much to leave you where you are. That's what God says to us. He wants, to, he wants us to grow. He wants us to see us become who he wants uh, who we can become in Him, the beauty and life that we can become in Him. And so, Esther actually wrote a bit of a song, and we're going to sing it for you this morning. I was empty and broken, and you came along. You saw me, you loved me. As I, you saw more in me than I saw in myself. You gave me a new name, you called me yours. And you say, Come as you are. But I love you too much to leave you where you are. Oh. You can have my heart. So, Father, sanctify me in your love. Oh, oh. 
I want to be holy, surrender daily, love like you love me, lead me, Lord. I know how I fail it, I turn my back, but you reached out with grace to give. You stay calm as you But I love you too much to leave you where you are. Whoa, you can have my heart. So Father sent his body in your love. Whoa. video that plays as we close with a little bit of if you're looking for my position in the north south south how you can see that kia ora koutou I'm going to show you how to play one of the songs that you asked us about what is the and how to get your foot wet in the month of Hukiri which is June July the start Kia ora koutou I'm going to show you how to find Matariki by using stars and constellations to help you point the way in the month of Pipiri which is June July the star cluster Matariki rises in the southeast, which is used to signify the coming of the Māori New Year. We are going to start here with Mahu Tonga, which is also known as the Southern Cross, from, found on lots of things like our flag. During the time of Matariki, you will find Mahu Tonga upside down to look more like an anchor. We are going to track east from this constellation along our journey to find Matariki. As we track along, we should find the, the brightest star in our sky, Hine Takarua, or also known as the Winter Maiden. As we continue in the same direction, we will come across three bright stars in a row, known as Toturu. Some people see the bottom of a pot, others see Orion's belt, 
but we are going to imagine a bird perch, or a paimanu, from which a bird is reaching up to pluck a significant star, puanga, or puaka. The star puanga is used by some iwi to indicate the coming of the new year, instead of the star cluster Matariki. But to find Matariki, we are going to use Totoru to point us towards the direction we need to go. Until we get to Te Matakaheru, a triangle-shaped constellation which is linked to a triangle-shaped Tainui spade of the same name. Now just off its shoulder, we will see a bright cluster of stars. This is Matariki. With a telescope, we would be able to see hundreds of stars that make up the star cluster, but with the naked eye, we can just point out about seven to nine of the brightest stars. This is what we know in Aotearoa as Matariki. Ariki means God's eye. Um, and when I read that, I, I thought, man, that reminds me of lots of scriptures that talk about how God's like looking um, down from heaven upon us. And that's a really comforting um, thought to have that. And it reminded me of the song, um, Te Reo song, E Te Ariki, which is Tirhiro Mai, um, look upon us, Lord. Um, and so I've invited my good friend Regina here to um, sing this beautiful song with me.
much on 1 verse 15 says this, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. Getting it? This is Jesus. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. Cool? He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Jesus is who we worship, and he is beautiful, and he is powerful, and he is present, and there is none like him. Isn't that good? Hey, I want to introduce a couple of friends of mine. They're new friends. Um, come on up, Brian and Gina. Let's give them a life's own welcome. We can welcome them even though we might not have any idea who they are. <laughs> but this is Gina, and Gina is a school nurse, and this is Brian. And Brian, you have a few hats, right? You are in, uh, one of the pastors at Bethlehem Baptist, um, working with Phase Youth, and you also are regional coordinator for 24-7 Youth Work. Awesome. I got that right. Hey, um, LifeZone has kind of been trying to enable youth workers in some of the local schools for quite a few years now. I can think back to Scott and I traveling to Valley Street Christian Center in, I think it was about 2016, meeting with a 24-7 youth coordinator there and just trying to get, it, make it possible for uh, the church to have representation, Jesus to have representation in the local schools in a way that would help people and bring glory to God. And so we leaned in and tried back then, and we couldn't quite get that over the line. And then a few years ago, we got really excited because we had uh, finance, we had a youth worker willing, but we couldn't get an opening into a school. We tried, but we couldn't get an opening into a school. So recently, it is like everything is coming into place. We have um, got some finance, we've got some openings in schools, and we've got some young adults who are really willing and available to be youth workers in the schools. And so, are you excited by that? I think I'm excited by that because part of our vision is that we would have community pastors leading community impact teams, restoring hope in individuals and communities by providing people with spiritual, emotional, and practical solutions to their needs. It's really hard to do that if you remove from people, right? You've got to be up close and personal with people. And so the potential to get people in schools doing that is just praise the Lord. Gina, school nurse, share a little bit about what you see, hear, experience in that role. All right, Morena Tefano. Um, so I became a school nurse about this time last year, and I'd spent eight years at home as a stay-at-home mum, and my background before that was nursing in hospitals. So um, I just didn't realise that stepping into the community in this kind of way was going to be a very confronting role, and it was very much going to move me out of my comfort zone and out of my safe place. So I just want to share a few stories with you this morning so that you guys understand where our young people are at and what is going on in schools at the moment. Um, and unfortunately, it's not a pretty picture. So, um, and these are stories that I've had from this year alone. So um, when I first started in the role, I, um, so a young girl came to me and she told me about um, what was going on in her family and that her mum is a pee addict and she's been a pee addict for about 25 years and that she has pipe parties about once a week and when she's high she gets very violent and unfortunately um, abuses this girl and often at 8 o'clock in the evening, 9 o'clock at night, this girl will be thrown out in the street and she'll have nowhere to go. Um, and so she came to us and we tried to support her and help her and got Oranga Tamariki, which is the old SIFs involved. Um, and Dad lives in Kowaro, um, but unfortunately that's mongrel mob um, country. And they, um, Oranga Tamariki felt that this was a good solution for her to go into that environment, um, but was decided against that. So right now this girl is still living in this home situation, living with, weak, with um, weekly violence. Um, um, I have another girl that was just brought into me the other week, and she... Um, um, was having a panic attack at school, and when I questioned this about her, I found out that mum is beating her with golf clubs, and that she is being kept up until two, three o'clock in the morning, um, 
because she hasn't cleaned the home perfectly enough and she has to redo that over and over again. Um, and she had moved in with her dad, but at this point in time, there are still two little brothers living in that environment at the moment. So family violence is one thing that we deal with. Um, another thing that we deal with is mental health. Um, we have so many students that are self-harming. Um, anxiety seems like a massive epidemic at the moment. Um, our guidance... Um, our guidance counsellors are full and booked up a month in advance and us nurses are absolutely full as well. And so we're struggling to manage the need that's there at the moment. Um, um, eating disorders is another huge thing as well. We've got a number of girls that we're holding at the moment who are living on about two or three meals a week. Um, they'll eat their dinners, but they will vomit those back up again. They're exercising for three hours a day, and so they are just not in very good shape either. But it takes about a month to get into help at the hospital, and it takes another month. That's just for an assessment, and it takes another month until they get picked up by medical care there. So we're holding a lot of these girls in this place at the moment. Um, so we carry a lot of risk there. Um, um, so also suicidality is a big problem as well. I, you might not have heard, but at the end of last year, we had a boy commit suicide at, um, at um, Mount Intermediate. And so that cohort of students all came to us at Mount College. And so this year, we've had a number of more suicide attempts as well. So it's not uncommon to have a student walk into our office and let us know they've taken an overdose of pills or that they feel too unsafe to go home tonight because they are feeling very suicidal. Um, we were just looking this last week at the statistics. And so every year the guidance team, they do a um, survey called Traveler's Survey. And this is to pick up the high risk kids at school so they know who to match with counselling. And so back in 1991, 10% of students were picked up as high risk students. Whereas this year, we're now up at 36% of students. So that means one in three year nine students, so that's form three students, are high risk students. So this explains why we're really struggling to do what we do. We just do not have the resource at school. Um, so I, w I was, I've just been thinking, in fact, I've been praying a number of years for our city and, um, and it's just amazing how all these doors have just opened at this time. And so as I just saw, um, sat and thought on this and prayed about this and I was really provoked about this because I thought, you know, these are God's sons and daughters. God loves these people and these kids are lost and broken and they're hurting and we just don't have the ability to help support them and meet their needs. And, um, um, and we refer them off to for services, but unfortunately the services are busy and overloaded and can only hold these kids for a short time too. I had a student who um, um, at 13 was so sexually promiscuous, she didn't even know how many men that she'd been with and who they were. And um, we referred her off to social work for help and social work looked after her for about three weeks and she got a boyfriend, long, a more longer term boyfriend, so social work said, yep, case closed, she's all good now. Well, two weeks later, this um, girl ended up in alt ed, which, which is short for alternate education, which is pretty much prison for school. Um, and so I just look at this and it just breaks my heart because these kids have not got a great opportunity ahead of them without the support that they need. And I just think the greatest thing they need is love and mentoring. And mentoring is a long-term journey. It's not just a one-off, a couple of appointments and, it's, and they're fixed and it's all done. It's a long-term journey. Showing these kids value, showing them truth, showing them love and showing them light and showing them that there is another way to live life. And so this was when I discovered 24-7. I also work at Bethlehem College a couple of days a week and um, Brian just happened to be there to introduce their service and I just thought, this is what we need in high schools. And because um, I do two days a week at Mount College as well. And the stories that I share from there are not just Mount College. These, these are, this is stories that are from all our high schools here in the Bay. So um, we have a massive need here. And I just thought, how can we bring the church who is called to be in that place of need, how can we combine that where the need actually exists? And so this is where I think 24-7 and partnering with the church with schools is an amazing opportunity. So I'll let Brian talk to you about that. Good morning. Um, these, these stories break my heart, um, <clears throat> must, must break that God's heart so much. Um, so yes, it's, life is tough out there. Um, for school kids, um, it goes right through to primary, primary, intermediate, it's right through to secondary. 
And we just want to be there to support these kids, to love these kids. Um, I saw the song, um, you know, God, see me as I am, love me as I am. And that's, that's pretty much what we're doing as youth workers, seeing these kids as they are, loving them as they are, meeting their needs where they're at. Um, these stories are, are terrible. We, we deal with kids um, from good homes but um, make da- bad decisions. Um, we deal with kids who have bad homes and are trying to make good decisions. Um, we're just trying to love these kids where they're at. So the 24-7 Youth Work is a collaboration between church and a school with community funding. Um, but there's a lot of rocks to get into place as well. As, as Steve said, we've got to have the finance, we've got to have the youth workers, and also the schools. The schools are very closed to, obviously, Christian things. Um, so when a secular school says, come and help us, you actually totally understand the need they have. And Gina sees this firsthand, the, the, and the counselling team sees this firsthand. Youth workers aren't counsellors. We're not nurses. We're not teacher aides. We go in, we basically just walk alongside the kids. Um, we just get to know them. We love them. Um, we're just a consistent thing in their lives. Um, sometimes they don't have consistency. Some kids go home at the end of the day, don't know actually where they're going home. Um, I dealt with a kid a few years ago. He carried a shopping bag around um, in his bag with his belongings. At the end of the day, he'd be picked up by mum and he would go somewhere that night. It could be a motel, it could be a friend's, it could be a campground. He just didn't have a home. So yeah, just, deal, just seeing these kids where they're at. Um, so yeah, just... It's really important for a church to get on board, and it's so amazing that we can go into Mount College. They actually want us there. They want youth workers in their school to walk alongside students to just to be there to support them, not to counsel them, but just to, just to mentor them, be positive role models in their lives. Um, but to get that happening, we need the, the, uh, the open door. Now, as, a, as an old Christian organization, we're going in not to proselytize or evangelize. We're basically just going in to be the salt and light of Jesus. We're going in there to serve his hands and his feet, to love on these kids. Um, So yeah, so with the setup, it's basically we need a church that's ready to be on board, which is incredible that LifeZone wants to get on board in support of the youth workers. Um, We need 25% funding from the church. We need 25% funding from the school. So there actually is a financial requirement from the school to get on board. And I think that's important because if they get a service for free, it's take it or leave it. But if they're actually financially involved, they are fully involved. And also community funding. So we'll be looking for community funding to support this venture as well. Um, obviously, this is all about God, and it needs so much prayerful support. Um, I really uh, just seek your su- support and prayerfully for your youth workers going into the school. Um, they are going to be encountering a lot of hurt and broken people, and they need prayerful support to cover them as well. So. Wow. It's an exciting opportunity. We've been pressing into this for a few years, like I said, and the school the finance and the youth workers have not always lined up. But today, I'm taking a step of faith and I'm asking you to take a step in faith. We have got some very generous people in Lifestone Church that are making it budget-wise, financially possible for a youth worker to go in. We have two youth workers that are wanting to go in. And so my challenge to you, my encouragement to you is will you prayerfully consider financially making it possible for two youth workers to go into a school? We can do so much more collectively as a church than what we can do individually, yeah? And so if everyone was making a small contribution, then it would be possible, I believe, to have not just two, but three or four. In this congregation, there are actually other people that are prayerfully considering being youth workers that are going into the schools. And it might be the encouragement that they need to say, yep, I'll step out if I have that support. So we're not talking, I, finance is funny, right? We're not talking thousands and thousands and thousands. We're talking 6,000 from a church, $6,000 from the church, same from the school, and then 12,000 from the community. And so we have got two incredible young adults. I'm going to invite them up now, Ezekiel and Carissa. And next Sunday, Carissa and Ezekiel are heading to Wellington with some others from the city, with some um, other youth workers from Curate. Am I getting that right? There's a a lot of detail, but they're heading down to Wellington for a three days, three days national training, which is going to help equip them to be salt and light in the school. And then we're hoping that term three might be a squeeze, term three or term four, that 
these two were going to be able to be at Mount College 10 hours a week being salt and light. And that's an incredible opportunity and what a difference that Jesus will make through them in the lives of people that are just, yeah, it's tough, like Gina showed us. And so church, can we stand and um, I want to pray for these two, but I also want to ask you to commit to prayerfully supporting these two. Maybe we can get, oh, I got to do a shout out to Morgan. Give us a wave, Morgan. How many people know that Morgan is strong woo, winning others over? And so Morgan has really been quite central in this. We've been on the edge of trying to do this for a few years, and more recently in the last few months, Morgan has probably won you guys over, wooed these two, and connected them with Brian and Gina. And so keep doing what you do, Morgan. Fantastic. Morgan actually wants to go in the school as well. Am I fair to say that? I've said not yet. <laughs> There's tension. Anyway, let's pray. Um, would you guys pray for these two as well? Is that, is that cool? Oh, Lord, I just pray your blessing on these two. Lord, I thank you that you equip us and you call us. And, Lord, that you give us what we need to do the job ahead of us. So, Lord, we just pray that these two would be empowered and strengthened by you. And, Lord, that they would be clear on their calling. And, Lord, as they go ahead and do this training, Lord, I pray that they would be blessed through it. And I pray that as they go into the school that they would be salt and light in that place. And, Lord, I pray that your love would fill them and flow out like a, like a um, living stream to touch these kids around them. I pray that you would give them knowledge and revelation and understanding how to speak to the broken places in these kids' lives, how to support them and how to love them. And I pray that you would develop, um, help them to develop deep friendships with these kids so that they can walk alongside them, journey with them, that they would be people that these um, students would look up to, that would value and honour them. And Lord, I just pray that in some way that they might lead many to Christ. And so, Lord, I pray as they go forward and step out that you would pave the way, that you would make the way clear before them, that you would release the finances and release everything they need. Lord, we declare your blessing over them now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Lord, I just thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, Lord, I thank you that Mount College is open uh, to 24-7, and for your youth workers to come in to be your salt and light in that school. Lord, I pray for Ezekiel and Clarissa, Lord. God, just really just um, that they'll continue to seek your face um, in every situation as they come across. Lord, I pray for this relationship between this church and that school. Lord, that it's not a, just a, a fleeting uh, thing, but a, a long-term relationship. God, that your, your will be done in this school. Uh, Lord, I just pray a blessing on this uh, new collaboration, this relationship that we're going to have. Just ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thanks, church. Why don't you grab a seat? And let's remember to pray. Next Sunday, they head to Wellington and are there for a few days. Um, whoo! Isn't it good that the church is alive? I love it. I love it. There is so, I, I did this illustration. I didn't plan to say this, but in the PSG this morning, I did the illustration that just kind of demonstrated how there's so many steps that people can take towards maturity in Christ. And I, the illustration that I used was, I remember when our kids were little and they kind of transitioned from drinking milk into eating solids. And then not only that, because when they're eating solids are in the high chair, you are sitting next to them and your meal's going cold while you feed them. Choo-choo train, all that, yeah? Anyone? And it's like your food is completely spoiled while you attend to the needs of the child. But the day comes when the child does this and they get it into their own mouth and they can feed themselves. In that process, man, does it get messy. How many people know? Food in the hair, behind the ear, on the tray, down the back, everywhere. It's just on the floor. There's a really massive mess. You know what? I always celebrate the good step that happened, not the mess. And so as a church, let's celebrate the good steps that God is doing in and through us as a community, being salt and light in the community. And there's going to be mess because we're not going to get it right all the time. Yeah? 
celebrate the good steps, the good steps, getting Ezekiel and Carissa into Mount College to be salt and light is a good step. It might be the difference in a young person's life. Not just their breath and their existence, but it might also be a difference in them being transferred from the dominion of darkness into God's glorious light. And so from here to there, it might get messy and we might not take the perfect steps and it might not be cut and dry and clean and nice and perfect, but celebrate the good step. Don't miss out on the good step. Don't focus on the, ooh, the negative. Focus on the glorious good that God is doing, yeah? Let's turn our eyes to the screen. What is the meaning of the gospel? What is the meaning of the gospel? What is restored through Jesus' death? We often only hear how the blood of Christ redeems our relationship with God. But what if there's more to the story? What if there was more aspects to the gospel than we've been taught? In our upcoming series, Gospel Clarity, we will be taking a deep dive into the biblical narrative and how God, ourselves, others and creation is intertwined into the overall story that we know of as the Gospel. Uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Hey everyone, uh, lovely to see you. My name, for those who don't met, know me, I'm uh, Mike Shadbolt, son of Chris and Wayne, uh, our awesome uh, tech team ringins, uh, husband of Charlie. I mean, come on, you know, that's, uh, that's a claim to fame there. And I've got to say, you know, it just warms my heart when I see gaffers go on to great things and we've got so many ex-gaffers who have uh, been part of Charlie's life uh, doing awesome things here in Life Zone and, and, and it's just wonderful. Father of Wisuwat, you might have heard him before, run up, uh, so excited, and feeder of Millie the Cat as well. Let's not forget that um, <laughs> as part of my, my, uh, my background. So I thought I'd open with a prayer uh, that I think sums up uh, my message today, and this is um, this is from Ephesians chapter one. It, it is Ephesians chapter one, and uh, I love the way that the the message version uh, puts it because it is a prayer and it is a poem. It goes something like this: How blessed is God, <laughs> right? And what a blessing He is. He's the Father of our Master Jesus Christ, and takes us to the high places of blessing in Him. Long before he laid down earth's foundations, he had us in mind. He had settled on us as the focus of his love to be made whole and holy by his love. Long, long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. What pleasure he took in doing this. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift giving by the hand of his beloved son. Because of the sacrifice of the Messiah, his blood poured out on the altar of the cross, we're a free people, free of penalties and punishments chalked up by all of our misdeeds. And not just barely free either, abundantly free. He, he thought of everything. He provided for everything we could possibly need, letting us in on the plans that he took such delight in making. And he set it all out before us in Christ, a long-range plan in which Everything would be brought together and summed up in Him. Everything in deepest heaven and everything on planet Earth. It's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. And long before we'd even heard of Christ and got our hopes up, He had His eye on us. We see that, right? Matariki. He had his eye on us. He had designs on us for glorious living. Part of the overall purpose, he's been working out in everything and everyone. It's in Christ that you, once you heard the truth and believed it, uh, this message of your salvation, you found yourselves home free, signed, sealed, and delivered by the Holy Spirit. This down payment from God is the first installment of what's coming, a reminder that we'll get 
everything that God has planned for us a praising and glorious life. And that's why when I heard of all the solid trust that you have in the Master Jesus and your outpouring of love to all the followers of Jesus, I couldn't stop thanking God for you. Every time I prayed, I'd think of you and give thanks. But I do more than thank. I ask, I ask the God of our Master, Jesus Christ, the God of glory, to make you intelligent and discerning and knowing Him personally. Your eyes focused and clear so that you can see exactly what He's calling you to do to grasp the immensity of this glorious way of life that he has for his followers. Oh, the utter extravagance of his work in us who trust him, the endless energy, the boundless strength. And all of this energy issues from Christ. God raised him from the dead and set him on a throne in deep heaven in charge of running the universe, everything from galaxies to governments, no name and no power exempt from his rule. And not just for the time being, but forever. He is in charge of all, has the final word on everything. At the center of all of this, Christ rules the church. The church, you see, is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. The church is Christ's body in which he speaks and acts and by which he fills everything with his presence. Ake, ake, ake. Amen. Just leave it there, probably. Uh, should, we, should we leave it with Paul? Ephesians chapter 1. Honestly, if you ever find yourself wondering, you know, what is God's plan for the world? Just read Ephesians chapter 1 again and again and again. Read it in 10 different translations to pick up a different nuance each time. If you feel discouraged, if you wonder if God really loves you, read Ephesians chapter 1 and get a refill. If you want to be inspired, what should I be doing? Read Ephesians chapter 1. Let's move on. Sorry, I'll get stuck there. Uh, wouldn't it be nice? Isn't it nice, actually? Because it happens uh, when you get more than you ask for. Yeah, have you ever had this kind of situation uh, where you get more than you thought you would? Uh, like you get a little extra bit of fish in your fish and chips packet, right? You're counting them out because you ordered four pieces and you count them out and you're like, oh, there's five, right? <laughs> do, you ever, do you ever have this? Yeah? Yeah, in fact, it's, it's almost at that point where it happens so often that you get disappointed if there's not an extra piece of fish and your fish and chips packet, or uh, if you stay like at a, at a motel or Airbnb, and you, 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 you walk in, and there's a little chocolate on your pillow, and you're like, oh, a little chocolate, right? <laughs> you weren't expecting it, it's all good. And perhaps the classic example of getting more than you expected is found in those late night infomercials. But wait, they say, there's more, right? <laughs> And the best one of all, I think, the best one of all is the Transformer Ladder. Yeah, you guys familiar with this one? Yeah, come on. <laughs> The transformer ladder, right? Uh, first of all, they tell you it's not just one ladder, not just two ladders, it's 24 ladders in one, right? So, yeah, whoa, it's like I just wanted to buy a ladder. I get 24 ladders. Where will I put them all? But wait, there's more, they say, and if that wasn't enough of a bonus, they start throwing in the free extras. Two work platforms, a wall standoff, two leg levelers, but wait, there's more. What about this set of drill bits? Got nothing to do with the ladder, right? It's just, we'll chuck it in. And a seven-piece grip set, uh, all these bonuses worth $1,200. You just wanted a ladder, but you actually ended up with a garage full of tools, right? <laughs> and sometimes... If we just think the gospel's a ladder, we are surprised to find that there is more. And we're seeking uh, over this next series uh, to get some clarity on what is the gospel. Is there even more than we might think? So let's, uh, let's take it back. What is the gospel? What does that mean? When, when you hear the words the gospel, what does it mean to you? And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a teacher at the same kind of high schools that you heard about this morning. Uh, it's not an easy life. Pray for your teachers. Um, but if there's one thing I've learned is that teenagers can spot a churchy word a mile away. And gospel uh, sounds like a very churchy word, right? It's the kind of word that you rarely use in normal conversation. Uh, but everyone just assumes that you know what it means anyway. And so everyone just kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah, totally know what that means. Yeah. Okay, so gospel, the word gospel. Uh, it, it comes from an old English translation of a Greek word, which is euangelion, euangelion, okay, which means good message. 
U meaning good, and angelion meaning message, just like angel means messenger. Uh, in Old English, it then sort of drives its way down to God's spell, okay, good, God, and spell meaning news, good news, good message. So, gospel means good news. But news, the word news, I think in, in our modern cultural understanding, it doesn't quite carry the right connotations, because we're in a world in which we're bombarded by up to the minute 24 by 7 news, right? We can get news, it pings to us on our phones, uh, you turn on the TV, you can get news up to the minute. And so news becomes actually quite common these days. And there's a, there's a Hebrew word in the Old Testament which is translated euangelion uh, in the early Greek translations of the, of the Old Testament, so the Septuagint. And that word in Hebrew is beser. And beser carries this connotation of a weighty news, a nationally significant news, a royal proclamation. For instance, when the throne is passed from, from David to Solomon, this is beser. This is the good news, the royal announcement. And beser is the word that the prophet Isaiah uh, uses when he announces the good news that one day, the Lord himself will return to a broken and defeated Jerusalem to free his people and to reign as king over the nations. Isaiah says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the messenger who brings good news, the good news of peace and salvation, the news that the God of Israel reigns. That is good news. But when we think about the gospel good news in a Christian sense, what comes to mind? What does it mean, for instance, to share the gospel with someone or to give a, a gospel message? And usually what we're thinking about is we're thinking about explaining about salvation, right? But when we say that the gospel is simply about our personal salvation, we're reducing the gospel down to just one component part. This narrower view of the gospel is, is as being just about Jesus' work on the cross as being this substitutionary death for my sin so that I can go to heaven is, is actually a reasonably recent take on this in, in terms of church history. And in this view, instead of the good news being about Jesus Christ and the announcement of a new king, instead it becomes a story about us. And we, we take the, the personal benefits that flow out of the story, and we make it the whole story. But wait, there is more, right? There's more. Just like the Transformer letter, the, the whole of the good news gospel is bigger than what we think. God is bigger than what we think. God is never going to be less than you can imagine. How can the author of imagination be less than what you can imagine? He's never going to be found lacking. I mean, just test him. You're not going to reach the depths of God. And don't get me wrong, the Lord is not some vending machine built to gratify all our petty wants, right? He is the author of life. He knows us, and he loves us anyway. And he gives us abundantly everything that we truly need. Paul uh, puts it beautifully in Ephesians chapter 3. He says, um, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask for or even imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. And so too is it with the good news of Christ. It's more than we can imagine. The good news is not limited to Christ's atoning death on the cross. That's important, but it's not the whole thing. It's not limited to releasing us from the eternal consequence of sin. I mean, that in itself is incredible, but it's more than that. And it's more than just restoring the relationship between God and man. So let's have a, a closer look at what the full gospel is. Handily, uh, we have four whole books in the Bible which are, which are dedicated to this task, right? Um, they are literally named as such. You've got the gospel, according to Matthew. You've got the gospel book, 
according to Mark, you've got the gospel according to Luke, and you've got the gospel according to John. And they're all telling of this royal announcement, the story of Jesus launching the kingdom of God. And they're making this claim that Jesus' story is the fulfillment of the Hebrew Scripture storyline, which is both the story of Israel and the story of all humanity. Okay, so uh, seeing as I'm a, a math teacher, uh, we'll do a quick lesson. So grab your calculators. Uh, yeah? No, actually, um, it's Sunday, so I take the day off math on, on a Sunday. Uh, so we're going to do a history and a geography lesson. Okay, so let's, let's pop up a little map here. Okay, so this is a, a map of um, the ancient world during, uh, uh, the, the, towards the end of the Old Testament. And at the time that Jesus was born, Israel had been under around about 700 years of military conquest and occupation by different empires. Okay, so you had, uh, you had uh, King David and King Solomon, you had, had um, the Jewish kingdom there, but then it, it split into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom of Judah, and things were not going well. People had forgotten about God. They weren't following God. They were following uh, the, the, the gods of their neighbors. They were, they were just, things were going terribly, and so the Assyrians, they came down from, uh, from the north, okay, so in green there, you can see down towards the bottom of the green bit, there's Jerusalem, okay, there's around that, that's Israel, and so the Assyrians, they came down from the north, defeating and scattering the northern kingdom, but not conquering uh, Jerusalem and Judah itself, but the northern kingdom, Bush, right? And then the Assyrian empire crumbled, and the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar, they came sweeping in from the east. So on the sort of eastern side of the green bit, light green bit there, there's Babylon. And they came sweeping through. And uh, they uh, came from what's modern day Iraq. And they came sweeping through and they conquered the whole region, including Jerusalem. So think here about uh, Daniel and his friends who were taken back to Babylon, right? And the Babylonian empire... It gets a lot of airtime in the Bible, but it actually didn't last all that long, just a couple of decades, uh, before the Medes and the Persians, from the purple area over to the east there, right? The Medes and the Persians, so from modern-day um, sort of Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, under Cyrus, they come sweeping through, and they take over a much larger area from the Babylonians as well. And they swept right through to modern-day Turkey, even up into sort of Greece there, and down eventually into Egypt as well. And they'd conquered this huge empire, and they reigned for a long time over some successive kings uh, for well over 100 years. And so in that time, you've got the stories of Esther, you've got Ezra and Nehemiah, and heading back to rebuild Jerusalem. And then there was the rise of the Greek Empire, because the Persian Medes tried to take on Greece, but they'd stretched themselves a bit thin, and so they, they annoyed the Greeks, and along comes this guy, Alexander, and he starts up there in the northwest, where it says Macedonia, right, from around there in Athens, and he comes on this massive crusade right through to the west, and he makes it all the way from Greece, uh, all the way to modern India, conquering everything along the way. And this around about the late 300s B.C., and so he went uh, uh, right across this whole part of the world, bringing with it the Greek language and Greek philosophy and Greek gods. So you can kind of see that Israel, on your way to conquering Egypt or conquering from Egypt or conquering left and right, it's sitting right in the middle. It's in the crossroads. And so you're getting conquered this way, conquered this way, conquered this way. It's one oppressive regime after another, one empire after another, coming along and conquering with war and with violence and with oppression. And each time that they come and conquer, they announce good news. Good news. We've brought peace and prosperity to the land by bringing these conquered people into our culture and empire. And so, at the time of Jesus, the most recent empire which had come along was the Roman Empire. But the Jewish people, they've been uh, living with a sense of expectation. The Hebrew Scriptures had promised them 
that the glory of the Jewish kingdom would one day return and a Messiah would rescue them. They were awaiting the good news of God's kingdom. And they were waiting a long time. They were waiting for, the, for Matariki to rise again. Right? And so in, when we come to the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see Jesus announcing the good news that the kingdom of God is at hand. In Mark uh, chapter 1, uh, one of the first things we hear about Jesus, it says, Now after John was taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God, the good news, saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Believe this good news. The kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus was announcing that the kingdom of God's, God had come and that he was the one bringing it. This kingdom that Jesus is announcing isn't just a kingdom of individually saved sinners. It's more than that. In uh, Luke uh, chapter 4, Jesus first announces his mission by reading out this passage from Isaiah uh, 61. And he reads out, In the synagogue, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Jesus began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Boom, mic drop, cue gasps, etc. Right? But this is the promise. It's a promise to the poor and the oppressed and the blind and the prisoners and those who are struggling with family violence and those who are struggling with eating disorders. Jesus comes to bring them good news. I'm a, I'm a, a fan of, of movies, I, I like a good uh, action flick. Um, Probably many of you do too. And uh, most action movies, when you boil it down, it it, it comes down to the good guy uh, defeating the bad guy by using force and violence to triumph, right? If if you're really honest about it, that's essentially how it works. So pretty much it's a plot to every superhero movie, okay? Basically, the bad guy gets punched in the face until he gives up, and then the good guy wins. That's that's essentially the story, right? Or uh, Fast and Furious, one or two or three or four, or 14, or 15, or what are we up to right now? Uh, whatever it is, right? But even the, the Roman emperors around the time of Jesus, right, we heard, they continually decreed that they had brought peace and justice to the world, but it was through violent subjugation and political power. And these emperors, they used the same language, the same vocabulary in their royal announcements as the so-called, of the so-called good news as the gospel authors did when they proclaim Jesus of Nazareth as the one who brings true peace and justice to the world. But in the good news of Jesus, the claim is that Jesus triumphed not by conquering armies or violent subjugation or political power, but by allowing himself to be killed by his enemies. And then even more shockingly, Jesus then was raised from the dead and gave his enemies an opportunity to enter into new life in God's kingdom by believing in him. But the gospel isn't just this bit at the end of the story, it's the whole thing. It's Jesus' life as well as his atoning death and resurrection. Let's, um, let's think of it another way, right? Um, have you seen uh, Titanic, right? Uh, I think it's possibly still the most watched movie of all time or something. Uh, it's the story, right? Titanic, if I just want to sum it up, it's the story of a guy called Jack who drowns and a girl called Rose who doesn't, right? That's the story, right? That's it, yeah? Sorry, spoiler alert, spoiler alert. Uh, there's the 10-year whatever thing on it, yeah? But that's it, right? That's the story, the bit at the end, yeah? Or Star Wars, right? Star Wars, it's the story of a guy called Luke who blows up a Death Star, right? That's it, that's the story, yeah? Or Lord of the Rings, it's the story of a guy called Frodo who drops a ring in a volcano, right? It's, that's it. 
I just saved you nine hours of your life. You know? <laughs> Gets a ride back on an eagle. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> See, we, mi- we miss the depth of the story when we just focus on the end. Right. So instead, the Gospel of Mark, uh, which, which is, is, is generally regarded as the earliest one, right? The Gospel of Mark, it starts out, chapter 1, verse 1, saying that what we are reading is the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. And then he goes on to tell that good news gospel as the entirety of the book. That's what the gospel is, according to Mark. But a whole book is a lot to communicate. I mean, can we boil it down to something shorter? Can we just focus on Jesus' atoning death for our salvation? Well, let's have a look at a couple of examples of preaching the gospel from the early church period. Uh, you got Peter in Acts 2 at Pentecost, and he's speaking to a whole bunch of, of a Jewish audience, and he says that the good news of Jesus starts with his life, his ministry, his miracles, his wonders, and his signs, proving that Jesus is the Messiah who had been promised in the Hebrew Scriptures. Or the Apostle Philip, when he's bringing the gospel to Samaria, in Acts uh, chapter 8, he says, uh, it said of, of what happens there, they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. And for that, they were baptized, both men and women. So the gospel focus here is the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus. And uh, Paul, in Acts chapter 28, when he's in Rome and he's speaking to the Jewish leaders in Rome, it says, He witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God. And from the law of Moses and from the prophets, he tried to persuade them about Jesus. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Again, the focus of the gospel here is the kingdom of God and Jesus as the fulfillment of the Hebrew Scriptures. And when Luke in Acts chapter 17 it records Paul's speech to the Athenians, right? So people who didn't have this, this Jewish understanding of who God was. He doesn't even mention the atoning death of Christ. He skips straight to the resurrection as proof that Jesus is this anointed Messiah. So there's a larger gospel than the narrow part we usually just focus on. The larger story is about Jesus announcing and bringing the kingdom of God. Perhaps um, the most well-known verse in the Bible is John 3.16. And it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God so loved the world. The Greek word for world here is a word you might have heard before. It's cosmos. It means the sum total of everything that is here and now. It's the world. It's the orderly universe. And it's the same place we get our English word cosmos. God loved the cosmos. It encapsulates the fuller meaning of the gospel. We just sometimes slide over it because we focus just on ourselves. Colossians uh, 1, uh, when Paul is, is opening his letter to the Colossians, he doubles down on this full gospel, that God's rescue plan isn't just limited to our personal salvation, but the reconciliation of all things. Try and imagine something that doesn't get contained in the set of all things. All things on earth, as well as all things in heaven, he says, For God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him. He's talking here about Jesus. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, things on earth and things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And from Paul's prayer, uh, part of what I read at the beginning in Ephesians chapter 1, God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. Do you ever, I'm just going to stop there for a second. Do you ever think to yourself, I wonder what God's plan is? What's God's plan for my life? Ephesians chapter 1, he's revealed his good plan. And this is the plan, colon, oh, oh. 
Here it is. This is the plan. We're giving it away here, right? We thought we had to kind of figure it out. It's, it's written down. Here is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and everything on earth, everything. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we've received an inheritance from God. He chose us in advance. He makes everything work out according to his plan. Yeah. This reconciliation plan, it's about all things, all things in heaven and earth. God loved the whole world. God loved the cosmos. The gospel is not just about repairing the relationship between us and God. It's about the other broken relationships as well. The broken relationship between us and others. And we heard about some of those broken relationships this morning. God wants to repair the relationship that we have with ourselves. And we heard about those, those people this morning who have broken relationships with themselves. And they take it out on themselves because they don't understand who they are in Christ. And he repairs the relationship, the broken relationship between us and his creation as well. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be going back into the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, and we're going to look at the story that leads up to the coming of this promised King Jesus. Because without understanding the story of our creation and our calling and how the relationships with God and ourselves and others in creation got broken in the first place, we won't truly understand what the good news is all about. We need to know the Papa of Jesus. We need to reflect back on what has come before leading up to Jesus. There's a, um, a diagram you might have seen before floating around on the internet. Has anyone seen this one before? Yeah? I quite like graphs and statistics and things, right? Gets me a little too excited uh, when I see some things like this. This is, in case you've never seen it before, along the bottom, the little black lines, they're quite thin, is every chapter in the Bible. And you can see the books kind of labeled there, right? And then the arcs are every time that one place in the Bible cross-references another place in the Bible. And the, the bigger the ark, the further distance between them. Uh, and there are 63,779 cross-references in the Bible. The Gospels and the New Testament, they don't live in isolation. They are constantly dialoguing, calling back to the Hebrew Scriptures. And Jesus himself said to the Jewish leaders in John 5, he said, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. Let me tell you, these are the very scriptures that testify about me. The Hebrew scriptures testify about Jesus. And Jesus himself, after his resurrection, went back through the Hebrew scriptures to his, with his disciples, explaining to them how they pointed to him and his kingdom. It says, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. And Paul writes in Romans 15, he says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. So in this series, we're going to look at those foundational scriptures so we can understand better what is this good news of the Messiah, of the kingdom of God. What is it all about? We'll look at Genesis 1 and 2, where we need to understand that we were created to be reflections and images and representatives of God out into this world. Representatives to rule his world on his behalf, to be wise stewards and priestly kings and queens. That's who we were made to be. And it breaks my heart when I see kids at school who are so far from that understanding of who we were created to be. If they just knew that God sees them as kings and queens and rulers, it would change their view of themselves. It would transform them. 
God wants us to take the world and to rule over it in, in using His wisdom, to steward it and to guide it, to harness its potential, to create beauty and order, to create an environment where life can flourish. And from Genesis chapter 3, we need to understand how humans decided to reject God's loving and careful and wise plan to slowly teach them what is good and what is bad by working and walking alongside them. They rejected it, and instead, they seized it all at once for themselves without God's loving guidance. And in that horrible moment, this terrible shift occurred, and those four key relationships were terribly and tragically broken. We'll look at the story of Abraham and God's covenant with him, that through Abraham's descendants, all peoples on earth will be blessed. We'll look at the story of Moses and how it shows us the need for a prophet, priest, leader who can lead and save God's people. And we'll have a look at how these four broken relationships can be mended through Jesus the King and the coming of the kingdom of God. To wrap up now, the gospel books are not just merely historical records. They are designed to advance a claim that will challenge your thinking and behavior. You are going to have to make a decision about Jesus after hearing his gospel claim of the good news of the coming of the kingdom of God. You are going to have to decide if you believe that the crucified and risen Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah of Israel, as promised in the Hebrew Scriptures. You have to decide if Jesus is the true King and Lord of heaven and earth and all creation. You have to decide if you're convinced that his love is stronger than oppression, stronger than powers and principalities, and stronger than death. That he has conquered everything under heaven and earth by the power of that love. And if you are convinced then Jesus calls you, just like the early disciples, to share and keep telling that good news to the whole world, that all things under heaven and earth belong to him. And if you are truly convinced that Jesus is your true king, then you live your life as a citizen of that kingdom, where relationships are restored, where the real leaders are those who serve through the power of God's Holy Spirit, where those with power and means are called to proclaim God's love by generously serving the poor and the hungry and the sick and the homeless and the oppressed and the kids at high school and the widow and the orphan. That is the good news for this world. And if you want to know more about this good news, or if you want to go all in on Jesus as king of heaven and earth and start living in this kingdom, please take the opportunity to do so this morning. Do not leave this place if God is calling you to be part of his kingdom. I'm so excited for the series that we get to take nine weeks to try and understand a little bit of the gospel. Um, and it's so beautiful um, that the gospel is so much bigger than we can imagine, so much bigger than we can think. And um, this morning, if you're like, man, I, I would love prayer. I would love to talk to Jesus and have, ha- have someone help me with that or with something. You can come forward to the front and um, we're going to sing and worship. Um, so, yeah. For God so loved the world, He gave His one and only Son. For God so loved the world, He gave His one and only Who ever believes shall have
Jesus, our Savior, forgive from him to reconcile us, to bring your kingdom to Lord, I pray that you'll give them the, the courage to step forward, Lord, and to ask more questions, Lord, and to find out more about your love, Lord, because 
it is life transforming, Lord, and, and it is good news. So we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome church, that just about brings us to the end. You can grab a seat if you want. A um, couple of little notices, little celebrations. Next week, we have two baptisms. Woo! But wait, there's more. The following week, we have eight baptisms. It's such good news. People have heard the good news and they want to take that stand, mark it in their life, draw that line in the sand to step over and say, I'm living for Jesus. If you also want to be baptized, please make that stand. Come and see Steve or call the office or one of us and um, we'll, we'll hook you up. So two next week and eight the following week. This week also, many of the staff are off on a pastoral transformation block course. And they would love your prayers that they could be upskilled, that they could be empowered and equipped to best serve our church whānau here. And as you know, we are now going to have our Matariki celebration feast. So I'm going to ask Ben Peters to come up and tell you how it's all going to work. Let's give Ben a hand. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so uh, right now we're going to pack up all the chairs. We're going to set up some tables. Uh, we do have a team that's here to do that, I believe. But if you guys could lend a hand just so we can get it all done a little quicker, that'd be amazing. Uh, the cafe for people who can't really uh, stay for that long, uh, the cafe is still open. So please feel free to go get a coffee. Uh, yeah. And we're going to have a really good time. I love doing really big meals and stuff like this because so I'm really blessed that Tim asked me to come do this. So we're going to have a really good time. Uh, there's some qu uh, quiz questions that I was just given today, and some of them are really funny. So, yeah, we're going to have a really good time. Uh, but if you guys can't stay, please just have an amazing day. I love you all. All right. Okay, bye. <laughs>